Welcome everybody to the July 2023 meeting of the Humanist Society of Santa Barbara. My name is Judy Flattery. I'm the president of the society. I also want to welcome our board members who are here today. Humanist Society of Santa Barbara is a 501c3 nonprofit. We're 100% volunteer run, founded in the mid 90s. We've got about 120 dues paying members. Our events are free and open to the public. And we welcome new members interested in humanism or anybody willing to contribute their talents. So today our speaker is Shristi Hoku, uh, talking about artificial wounds, uh, exploring the story of an emerging health technology. How does this relate to humanism? Well, I looked at the Paul Kurtz affirmations of humanism and I found three that I thought apply to this topic. One is that we are committed to the application of reason and science to the understanding of the universe and the solving of human problems. We believe science and technology can contribute to the betterment of human life. And we respect the right to privacy. Mature adults should be allowed to fulfill their aspirations, to express their sexual preferences, to exercise reproductive freedom, to have access to comprehensive and informed health care, and to die with dignity. Those three seem to apply. So who is our speaker? Our speaker is a Kashmiri Canadian who loves exploring ethical, existential, emotional, and equity issues. She's a humanist chaplain. She serves her community at the University of Ottawa. Trishti is a lifetime member of Humanist Canada, a supporter of the American Humanist Association, Humanist UK, Humanist Australia, and Humanist International. She's also a humanist officiant, providing a range of ceremonies from child adult namings to weddings and celebration of life services. Trishti is passionate about creating spaces that maximize human potential by leveraging a trauma-informed, anti-oppressive, healing-centered lens. She's especially moved by sound public policy and 2SLLGBTQIA plus issues, um, including sexual, romantic, and reproductive rights and justice. As the first racialized and youngest accredited humanist chaplain in Canada, Shristi is also passionate about immigration, integration challenges, diversity, including disability and neurodiversity, and social determinants of health. She holds a master's degree in public administration from Queen's University and is a completing a co tutel which is a joint PhD in population health and medical anthropology from Macquarie University and the University of Ottawa. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Shristi. Thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you. Thank you so much. So wonderful to see so many of your faces. You all look very kind, and I'm looking forward to an engaging, hopefully, discussion with all of you. As I said, hi, everyone. And as Judy already introduced me, my name is Shrishti Huku. Thank you so much for taking time to be here from Santa Barbara, California on a Saturday afternoon. I'm really so thrilled to be here with all of you. And I can't believe that we can communicate so fluidly and you know, once again, thanks to technology that we're able to collaborate beyond borders as humanists. So this is really, really, really special for me. So thank you so much for being here today. I wanted to uh, definitely thank Evan Clark, who connected Judy and I for making this event possible. And I wanted to thank Judy. She's been very patient with me as I've been sending her emails, trying to get to know all of you at uh, the Humanist Society of Santa Barbara a little bit better. Now, if there's anyone out there from Humanist Canada, thank you so much for taking the time to join us. I really appreciate it. And I wanted to extend a uh, thanks to my supervisors for my doctoral research, both Dr. Angel Foster at the University of Ottawa and Dr. Lisa Wynn, who is at Macquarie University in Sydney, Australia. They've been super supportive throughout this whole research process. And as I'm sure all of you can imagine, 
a PhD is an individual exercise, but it cannot happen without having a strong community around you. So for everyone who supported me, a really big thanks. And a special shout out to my mom and my dad, who are always taking care of me in lots of different ways, but especially for creating an environment where I can choose to live courageously. That's something that I think is really pertinent as we move into the, the topic of our conversation today in terms of reproduction and the future of technologies that are out there. So I wanted to just recognize them. So having said all of that, let me get the boring yet important stuff out of the way. The opinions that I express in this presentation do not reflect the views of any organization or person with which I may be affiliated. If you have a concern or an issue or confused about anything that I'm saying or want to just chat more or clarify something, I always welcome that. And like I said, there'll be opportunities throughout the presentation for us to pause and reflect as a group. And you're always welcome to reach out to me if we're not able to connect during the event or you just didn't feel comfortable to do so. Um, and we can chat further on anything that I've discussed or anything at all. You can reach me through my website, which is shrishtihuku.ca. And I know that's not the easiest to spell for everyone, so I'll make sure to have that up on my last slide as I do my closing remarks. And I also wanted to say that I encourage you to prioritize self-care and your well-being as we move through the topic today. There are going to be some sensitive subjects that come up and, you know, they can be triggering for some folks. So I just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge that. And, you know, I encourage you to take a break, walk away, you know, get support from me or someone in your broader community if you need it, as we talk about some of these, these issues. And um, I've listed two of my favorite support lines in case anybody does need to chat with someone. They are super friendly. Uh, one is All Options Talk Line, which is a secular talk line uh, dedicated to all um, sexual and reproductive health issues, but specifically parenting, adoption, surrogacy, and infertility, as well as um, abortion. And then there's Faith Aloud, which is a counterpart, so provides spiritual care related to the same sexual and reproductive health spectrum issues. So I wanted to tell you a little bit more about who I am and why you should care really what I have to say about the potential future of human reproduction and how it's linked to humanism. As you know, humanists come in all shapes and sizes. As a community, we have a lot of varied interests and a lot of varied experiences that have brought us to where we are today. And although we have shared values, we often have unique experiences that have led us to a particular set of biases or beliefs. And I think it's really important for all of you to know what those might be for me as I come into this presentation. In academia, we call this positionality and positionality as a researcher is really important to acknowledge. So for me, this means specifically that my family is composed of, as far as we know, at least seven generations of Kashmiri pundits. For those of you who don't know, Kashmir is the most militarized zone in the world. And as a member of the Kashmiri community, I want to take a moment to acknowledge that we faced intergenerational trauma, we've lost access to our mother tongue, and we're internally displaced due to ongoing religious conflict and related genocide. Now, some of these folks on screen that you can see here are some of my favorite people. Um, on the left-hand side is my maternal grandparents. Um, so my Nana, who is my maternal grandfather, actually in an effort to escape poverty moved my mother and his young family to Liberia. So they lived there until the military coup happened 
and then they had to suddenly escape. So you can imagine how these events might influence some of my perspectives. In terms of culture, my family speaks English and Hindi, and except for me, are all practicing Hindus, or in the extended Liberian portion of my family, are devout Christians. Many years later, my father, who's in the middle there, and my mom, after they got married, they decided to move as economic immigrants to the United States. And in fact, we moved to California, which is where I grew up, which is part of why this event is so special for me. So I want to share with you that California, there's me in my little NASA uniform in grade five in, uh, in Laurelwood Elementary School, in, just outside of San Jose, um, is really the heart and the start of my journey as far as it comes to irreligiosity and becoming a techn technology enthusiast. Growing up in that part of the world, um, it's hard not to get infected by the Silicon Valley technology bug. So as I share my story with you, I wanna acknowledge that there's a lot of privilege there and there's a lot of privilege that has been afforded to me as someone who was born in India but has traveled and lived all over the world and has been educated predominantly in the US, in Canada, in Sweden, and in Australia, which colors my perspectives. And in the interest of full transparency, as you can see probably from these photos, I'm a non-conformer on all fronts. Um, as Judy mentioned, I'm a humanist chaplain. I'm also a humanist officiant. And I've never been pregnant, I've never been married, and I have no children. So having said all of that, I think it is still important to recognize that I think community is super important. And so I've spent a lot of my life supporting folks the best that I can to deal with a whole host of issues, just issues that come up because we're all human. So they're generally what I like to call the four E's, existential, ethical, emotional, and equity-based issues. And I'm almost done my PhDs, I hope. Um, and I'm really excited to share with you a little bit of my research today and a little bit of my expertise. And I hope that we can have a fulfilling conversation. So through my PhDs, as well as volunteer work, um, I've engaged with the entire sexual and reproductive health spectrum. So that includes parenting, emergency contraception, sexually transmitted infections, infertility, and abortion, just to name a few issues. But my real passion is artificial wombs and how they link up with health, ethical, legal, and social issues, including anthropological ideas of kinship, meaning making, disease, and gender. So now that you know a little bit about me, I think we should talk about what the game plan is for the next little bit. Um, although I've told you that I'm an academic in training, I'm going to let you in on a little secret. I actually don't love lecturing people. I much prefer to engage interactively so that we can all learn and grow together. And so that's exactly what I'm hoping to do today, which might feel just a little bit outside of your comfort zone, but trust me, that's really where the magic happens. So as part of this talk, I'm gonna focus on three key things. The first is what I've already alluded to by asking you to grab um, some writing utensils and a pen and um, paper is what I like to call a values clarification exercise. And some of you have, I think, been involved in Planned Parenthood and other organizations, so you've probably seen this before. The next part is what I'm hoping will be a focus on some highlights of reproductive history. And then the last part will be moving together to really look at the journey of artificial wombs from their start in 1923 
to their potential as part of the future of human reproduction. Does that sound like a good plan? Okay, awesome. Looks like people are okay with that, great. So I'm gonna ask you three questions and you can either unmute yourself and respond or you can type into the chat and maybe Judy and Dave can help me read out the answers. So my first question is, are you ready to step outside of your comfort zone? <laughs> Marianne, I love the thumbs. <laughs> Thank you. My second question is, do you like to challenge the status quo? Yes, I can see some people saying yes. <laughs> awesome. All right. And lastly, my fellow humanists, do you ever get lost in thought about making the world a better place? Yeah, I know. Totally guilty as charged. I can see some nods. I can see some people saying yes. Okay, awesome. So I think we have all of the ingredients to make this a success. And so I'm going to get started by moving us into the values clarification. If you don't know what a values clarification exercise is, it's basically an opportunity for you independently to reflect on your values based on a series of statements that I'm going to put on the screen related to sexual and reproductive health. And you're going to decide as I move through the different slides, whether you agree, disagree with the statement, or maybe neither and then reflect on the why. So as we go through each of the statements, you're gonna to wanna to take a few notes on why you believe what you believe or if something makes you really angry or if you have a strong feeling or reaction or thoughts about anything, make sure to note them down because at the end of this, I'm gonna open up the floor and invite all of us to discuss some of the feelings that we had as we went through the value statements. Here's the first value statement. Sexual education should only be taught in private households. So agree, disagree, and why? Reflection. This is really good. This is really bad. You can take notes so that you can remember when we come back into our group. Second one, penis in vagina sex is the purest way to conceive. Third one, contraception undermines family values and the fabric of society. So agree, disagree. <laughs> Marion, I like whoever is sitting there with you. He's very, very enthusiastic. <laughs> All right, let's move to the next one. Natural pregnancy is better than having interventions like a cesarean, also known as a C-section. Okay. Pain in childbirth reflects the selfless nature of women. Got a few more. Surrogacy is exploitative. Abortion is only acceptable in rare circumstances. Next one. Adoption is a moral act. The next one, every child should have two parents. And last but not least, using assisted reproduction is playing God. Okay. I hope that gave you enough time to think about those statements. It's supposed to be a nice balance between enough time and actually just getting your, your first instinctual responses. So now that you've had a chance to look at those statements, I'm hoping that we'll feel comfortable unmuting and actually discussing some of those statements together. So does anyone wanna get us started? Any statements that you felt really strongly about? I will turn the floor over to you. Uh, I, I can pipe in on something. I yeah, mean, the sure, first one, ahead. I'm just going in order. The first one about sex education, we don't do that with math. Uh, just say, wow, you should really only learn math from your parents. 
And it's this, in my opinion, unnecessary baggage that we have around sex that some people want to separate it out and have it trained by people who probably aren't very competent in delivering that training that we don't do with anything else. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Thanks, Dave. Other, other folks? Robert, There's, go ahead. There was two that popped out. One was this thing about purist. Uh, that sounds like kind of a religious thing, so I don't know how to process that. But the thing about uh, assisted reproduction, I don't believe in any gods, so that, that doesn't apply. But uh, in some sense, it's no different than other health care, except for one thing. There are going to be evolutionary consequences. And, and are you saying that there are not evolutionary consequences to other health interventions? Just wanted no, to there are. There, there are. are. Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Right. Yeah. Perfect. Makes sense. Yeah, I, I agree with the uh, idea that there are going to be evolutionary uh, consequences. But to me, uh, with respect to the penis and vagina sex is the purest way to conceive, I think there are much better ways of conceiving through genetic engineering. <laughs> and awesome, I, I, I'm a believer in intelligent design by humans. Interesting. <laughs> Transitioning Interesting. from from uh, 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 evolution through natural selection, but by, to intelligent design. Okay. Well, we're going to have to talk about what that looks like. So whether that goes into the the <laughs> eugenic space or whether you have something else in mind. It actually has implications for. Uh, artificial wombs, because I'm an engineer, and as an engineer, uh, an artificial womb open, opens up the design space. Yeah, absolutely, it does. I'm really excited to have you on the call. This is going to be fun to talk about. Yeah, I'm really excited about artificial wombs, actually, for that. <laughs> and the other reason I like artificial wombs is my niece doesn't want to uh, have kids because it's so because she's watched too many episodes of... of uh, uh, Grey's Anatomy? <laughs> Anatomy, the, the one about the, uh, uh, the the British show. Anyway, about the, the show what's happened when 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 you're having babies. Yeah. So, yeah. When I told her about artificial wounds, she got very excited. Anyway. Oh, good, awesome. We'll put her in touch with me. Anybody else want to share? Judy, I see you're. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, yeah. I'm looking at my notes. I mean, I I'm looking at one through ten. Disagree. 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 <laughs> disagree. Fuck that. <laughs> so, um, excuse my Love language, it. but I no, think that was great. the one about, you know, uh, something about women, uh, that having, you know, that the, the pain of childbirth is the selfless nature of women. No, I mean, gosh, I remember giving birth and they're like, okay, we're, we'll give you the epidural, but make sure you can wiggle your toes. And I really couldn't wiggle my toes, but I'm like, oh yeah, I'm doing it. I'm doing it. You know, I <laughs> was really all in favor of having it be as comfortable as possible. In con contrast to my mom who delivered at a Catholic hospital where they were like, oh, you should suffer. It's good to suffer. You know, it's redemptive to suffer while you're having your kids. So, oh, and the other one I saw is about the one parent, two parents. Mm. And I said, well, I think one good parent, well, two good parents is better than one good parent. One good parent is better than, I think, one good and one bad, which is better than two bad parents. So that's, I was disagreeing on that one. I love it. Pulled out some philosophy there. That's good. <laughs> and I think it's good to adopt kids, to give kids a family if they don't have one. And, and numerical that philosophy one. besides. <laughs> yes. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, Wayne. Oh, I just, just a comment on, also from an engineering background, I guess artificial wounds scare me because we have such a limited understanding of how the human body works and how their systems are so subtle and interactive um, that I think we, we're getting way over our head to think we could we could duplicate that. I mean, you know, that's obviously for people more deeper into that particular technology, but from an outsider, it just seems like, man, there's so many things can go wrong on a, on a system that's way more complex than we understand. It. That could be a good use for AI. But when they understand humans, they might be able to come up with an artificial wound that works. I love it. I love it. So as we move through, we're going to actually talk about the origins of artificial wombs, and then we can talk about some of the common fears and potential benefits. And I, I'd love to hear your thoughts when we move into that section. The, the only one I agreed with was every child should have two parents 
because I, I think two is better than one overall and on average. Just, just you know, look, looking at the the um, uh, uh, the statistics and so on, uh, the, the children who have two parents uh, do a little better than those that have one parent. So I, I think overall, it, it seems better to have two than one. Now, that's yeah. the only one I agreed with. I, I disagreed with all the others. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting perspective, Ted. And um, I, I think it would be great to actually look at some of that data and see if we could tease apart, well, you know, is it around the fact that there's a certain number of parents that were having potentially better outcomes? Or is it other factors that we will get into during this, like, you know, poverty or, um, you know, the devaluation? devaluation of things like motherhood, etc. So uh, it'll be interesting, I think, to dig further into that data and see what the, you know, there, there, there could be a correlation there, but is it an actually like a, a causal factor? Mm. Meredith has her hand raised. Two parents or one parent really is connected to re the responsibility for the child and the ability to to uh, give the child attention and all those kinds of things that having par a partner can help, you know, on, on, on those uh, questions and uh, on economic, on uh, the financial matters and all of those kinds of things. So I'm glad you're talking about that yeah, uh, in yeah. addition. Absolutely. I really appreciate that intervention, Meredith. And uh, what I just wanted to say was there, there is a bit of an assumption in this statement insofar as you should have two parents, not three parents, not four parents. Uh, so thinking about some other cultures where, you know, community-based systems of rearing children are much more encouraged. There are definitely some flawed ones. I won't say which ones, but I can think of a few. But And also looking at as sexuality evolves, uh, whether people are in non-monogamous, consensual non-monogamous relationships, um, and, and how that influences how they choose to parent. So some interesting things that I hope we can talk about a bit more in the Q&A. Marion had her hand up. Yes, yeah. I was thinking of the statement, it takes a community to raise a child. So I thought of maybe there could be arrangements where you have several, several families together and they're all all of the parents are raising a child. And certainly we, we, we don't think that it has to be one man and one woman. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I really appreciate that, Marianne. Thank you. And can I ask who's sitting with you so that- This you is my husband, you? Marty. Better Hi, have. Marty. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Does anybody else want to jump in? Yeah, I'll, I'll uh, uh, say it might just be one person. Yeah, sure. it, uh, sexual organs organs will disappear, and uh, we won't. Uh, you won't need to have any any more than one. It's certainly Very. not sure, but I don't think it's that far away. I I think you're right, and uh, parthenogenesis is something that I'm going to talk about a little later. So very briefly, but certainly thank you for raising it. I'm a I'm a daughter of an engineer, so I do I do love this. <laughs> Awesome. Well, I really appreciate the discussion. I hope that it was interesting for all of you to think about your values as we think about the sexual and reproductive health spectrum. So now that you've had a chance to reflect on these statements, what I'd like to do is actually talk about some major American reproductive history milestones. So if anyone is a historian out there, I apologize if there's anything that is like glaringly erroneous. Uh, this, is not, this is not an attempt at post-truth. Um, I am not a historian, but I do a lot of reading and I tried my best to cobble together some really important milestones from an American perspective, which is not my area of expertise. But I, I hope that this helps, you know, put the sexual and reproductive health uh, changes and interactions with technology in perspective as we move into the last part of this conversation, which is around the future. First and foremost, I wanted to highlight starting in the 1820s, so that's about, 
you know, 200 years ago, that there was a use of often deadly herbs and fungi to facilitate abortion. So really interesting that states actually started to regulate abortion insofar as attempting to control different poisons that were being used and ultimately killing people who were trying to use them as abortifacients. And a year later, in 1821, Connecticut actually passed the first statutory abortion regulation in the U.S. So the punishment for abortion at that time was a life sentence. Three decades later, in 1851, Massachusetts passed the first adoption law. That's the first modern adoption laws that we're, we were starting to see. And then in 1857, the American Medical Association, which I was shocked to find out um, because we often consider them a partner in evidence-based scientific work that we would like to promote as humanists, launched a campaign to attempt to criminalize abortion. A few years after that, in 1869, the Catholic Church condemned abortion at any stage of pregnancy, which was really, really significant internationally. A few years later, in 1873, the Comstock Law came into play. Some of you may be familiar with this, but the Comstock Law was essentially a ban that was passed by Congress that prohibited the distribution of and information about contraceptives. So you can imagine why this is really significant. In the 1880s, almost all states now had some sort of law criminalizing abortion in some way. And then in 1888, the first baby was saved in an incubator in the United States. Moving into the 1900s, Margaret Sanger, who I'm sure most of you have heard of and who, as I think we've of late discovered had some controversy in her beliefs, um, coined the term birth control and was eventually indicted under the Comstock law that I just mentioned for, for this. A few years after that first indictment, um, Sanger continued and actually opened the first birth control clinic. This birth control clinic is actually a precursor to Planned Parenthood. Ultimately, she was arrested and spent time in prison. Now, being fearless, Sanger decided to partner with Gregory Pincus, who was a scientist, and together in 1951, they created the first oral contraceptive pill pill absolutely changed reproductive history. Many years after that, in 1960, the FDA finally approved the first oral contraceptive. It was different than the one that Singer and Pincus had created, but there was one that was approved and available for market. In 1965, we have some really important case law that comes into precedence. So it's Griswold v. Connecticut. Um, and some of you may already be aware, but this was the Supreme Court ruling that said that couples actually have a right to privacy, meaning that they have a right to access contraception. In 1967, Colorado finally allowed for abortion for cases of incest, fetal defects, and mental health. So you can see how long that took. Moving a little bit closer to home into the 70s, we had some more really important American case law come out. So Eisenstadt, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, be Baird. And in that case, the Supreme Court ruled that Massachusetts law that prohibited the sale of contraceptives to unmarried women was actually unconstitutional. Another big shift in attitudes. Now, in 73, as we all know, the Supreme Court granted women the right to abortion under the constitutional right 
to privacy in bro versus Wade. And we're going to come and talk about that right at the end. In 1976, the Hyde Amendment was passed, which is really significant from a funding perspective because it basically indicated that Congress had said that, you know, um, federal funding or the use of Medicaid for abortions is prohibited. And then in 1981, we had the first American IVF baby that was born. Her name was Elizabeth Carr. In 1982, the Abortion Control Act was passed in Pennsylvania. So these are some of the acts, similar to some of the acts that we're seeing now, uh, where there are impositions of 24-hour waiting periods, and at that time, there was a requirement for married women to inform their husbands, and there was a mandate that any minors had to have parental consent prior to seeking an abortion. In 1984, the FDA approved the copper IUD, so diversi diversifying the landscape in terms of contraceptive options. In 1989, the first surrogacy-friendly laws are created in Arkansas. And a few years after that, in 1992, another big, big ruling was the Planned Parenthood versus Casey case. And although it upheld much of Roe v. Wade, there was also uh, respect for some of the provisions of the Abortion Control Act. So this, this ruling essentially allowed states to continue to restrict abortion access as long as they did not impose undue burdens, whatever that means. Now, in 1996, an international event happened that um, was quite significant with Dolly the sheep being born. So that was the first instance of cloning. And then in 2000, the FDA approved mifepristone, which many of you may know as medication abortion. Now, in 2006, the sale of over-the-counter emergency contraception was finally approved for sale to women and men over the age of 18. Really huge shift in terms of the provision of emergency contraception. Now, some more important case law. So Obersfeld and Hodges versus Hodges, excuse me, um, was the decision in 2015 by the Supreme Court to permit same-sex marriage. And so this removed any last states that were lagging behind in terms of changing those laws internally. In 2020, we had a huge milestone in terms of prematurity. So the first extremely premature baby survived. That was 21 weeks and one day. So extremely premature. Before that, we were struggling to sort of break that 22-week barrier. In 2021, the FDA approves the first long-acting injectable form of HIV prep or pre-exposure prophylaxis. So essentially... This changes the way that we can manage exposure to HIV. So people don't need to take a pill daily. They can take a long, um, a long acting injectable every few months. And then lastly, and very sadly, in 2022, Roe v. Wade is overturned. So I just want to take a moment to pause and see if people have any reactions hearing some of those very productive milestones, seeing over the last couple hundred years how things have shifted. Does that change any of your perspectives, any of your values? Does it change how you feel about technology? Just, I find it interesting, all the different aspects and how long these conversations have been going on and the different ways of approaching it and attacking it and the back and forth of it all. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Judy. I think Marion, you wanted to say yeah. something. 
it's very upsetting to me that it all depends on who's in power and making these decisions. Mm -hmm. And if only we could pass a law that says you can never impose your religious beliefs or your whatever beliefs on people who don't share those beliefs. And that's sometimes the problem with enshrining things in law is it's, it's easier to change um, back and forth. It's, it's, a very, it's very difficult to know what the right answer is. But I, I do want to highlight what I thought was interesting is how some of these things ebb and flow over time. Like we can see how abortion has shifted, but we can also see how we're applying different principles to different parts of the sexual and reproductive health spectrum, which I always find quite interesting. So adoption, abortion, in vitro fertilization are becoming more and more acceptable while other rights like contraception, et cetera, are being taken away. So I think very interesting to think about what are the underlying narratives in society that are allowing these things. They're not often mapped all together. They're usually we focus on, okay, what happened in abortion? What happened in adoption? What happened in surrogacy? And we take them as independent timelines, but I hope this shows you how some of these things are interconnected. Um, I think Gary and Pat, you both had your microphones unmuted. Well, I was thinking of adding a data point. In ancient Rome, uh, they would kill babies that were deformed. Mm. Yeah. A whole different <laughs> attitude. Absolutely. And, I mean, we we still make a lot of choices in terms of pre-implantation genetic diagnoses, and when we decide, you know, due to fetal anomalies, we want to abort pregnancies. So there's certainly a lot of value judgments around life and whose life um, should be prioritized or how we want to handle potential suffering of fetuses. I think that's quite, that's quite interesting. I have one other thought. Yeah, this go this ahead, thought's Judy. been going through my head the last couple of weeks. You know how yeah. in Florida they have that stand your ground law? Like if anybody comes into your house, like you can kill them, right? Because they like invaded your space. So I'm like, I wonder if it's possible to use that law in an abortion case saying I've been invaded and there is an intruder in my body, which is even more of my home than my physical home is. And, uh, you know, to use that kind of same uh, I've heard that. point of view, stand so, my ground. Yes, I don't want this intruder. In me yeah. kind of thing. Yeah, that's an interesting perspective for sure. <laughs> David and Romy, did you want to add something? I do find the the timeline you presented uh, extremely interesting and in how, as you said, it it shows more than one one uh, timeline for one topic. And I, maybe a minor question: the baby that was born so premature in 2020 is that child still alive? That's that's my understanding. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. The baby actually holds the Guinness Book of World Record. Well, I, I hope that this was interesting in terms of putting all of these different components of the sexual and reproductive health spectrum in perspective. I want to highlight that these milestones don't even mention things like CRISPR or gene editing, which I'm sure some of you have heard of in the news over the last three years, or parthenogenesis, which Gary and I were talking about earlier in terms of asexual reproduction, which does happen in a number of species, and they're exploring that possibility in humans. There's also things like successful uterine transplants that have happened and live births that have resulted after uterine transplants. So there is just so much going on in this space. And I want you to keep that in mind as we move to the next and last section. So what do you think of when you see the term artificial womb? I want to gauge what you already know about artificial wombs or what comes to mind when you hear this term. I think of sci-fi movies and all the you know, little tanks with uh, hoses and wires into them. I can't see who said that, but thank you. Uh, well, I, think, uh, I think of Brave New World. Yep, good old Huxley. Thanks, Robert. I'm excited as in it as as an engineer and thinking of uh, problems it's going to solve and and uh, removal of design constraints. <laughs> uh, and on top of that, I have heard about it before. I, a few years ago, I uh, read an article about work being done in the Netherlands. Yes. 
Exciting. And, uh, so I, 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 I haven't followed it since then. Maybe you can give us an update of what the status of work on it is. Yeah, absolutely. Very happy to do that. When I see it, I, there were two things that I thought of. One is the matrix, where you have all those <laughs> cells, people growing in pods. Yep. And, and the other is, you know, thinking about well, an artificial heart, which is something that doesn't really work anywhere near as well as a regular heart or an actual heart, but you use it in an emergency. Yeah. And which actually seems like a more simple thing to develop than uh, a womb. So I have kind of the same reaction Wayne did that, man, it seems like the ability to really have equivalently performing womb that we built seems, seems like a reach. Yeah. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. And I really appreciate the range of perspectives and the wide range of exposure that people have to this thought, especially things like what does it look like in terms of popular culture and media? And again, the narratives, again, that are, you know, influencing folks and society in terms of how they think about these kinds of technological interventions. I would worry about the militarization. So much of technology is, uh, you know, turned into weapons. You're, so. you're, you're not alone in that, Romy, and I'm definitely going to jump into that. So now let's start at the beginning. Where did this whole idea of artificial wombs come from? Well, you'll be heartened to know that it's been around for about 100 years. At the tender age of 31, in 1923, J.B.S. Haldane, who was a British scientists eventually gave up his citizenship and became Indian, gave a lecture to the Heretic Society. I feel like <laughs> this is happening all over again. Now, at this lecture to the Heretic Society, which was, as you can imagine, an intellectual club at the University of Cambridge, he challenged traditional and religious authorities and this club was frequented by others that I'm sure you've heard of, like Bertrand Russell and John Maynard Keynes. J.B.S. Haldane presented what is now known as Didalis. This was his treatise or predictions for the future of science. Embedded within this grand vision that Haldane presented was a prediction that the first ectogenetic child would be born in 1951. He went so far as to actually predict, as you can see in this quote, that after this first birth, ectogenesis would become completely universal. As we've already shared, Haldane's vision has yet to become realized. However, there are technological efforts happening all over the world where scientists are actually trying to reproduce reproduction. In terms of terminology, so yes. endogenesis means growing within the body yeah. and ectogenesis is outside the body? Yeah, exactly. Okay. So that's exactly where I was going. Oh, sorry. So, <laughs> no, that's okay. That's perfect. What exactly is it? Well, an artificial womb is a piece of technology that in theory would facilitate gestation ecto, exactly like Judy said, outside of the human body. And some of you might be wondering, like, how is that different than an incubator? Because in some ways, an incubator does facilitate gestation outside of the human body. Well, the way that Haldane imagined it, it would actually facilitate external gestation from day zero. So this would entirely separate, not his language, this is my language, penis and vagina sex and reproduction. So sexuality and reproduction would then become independent entities. Now we're going to take a look at what happened when we fast forward almost 100 years. Gary alluded to that some of this already. In 2017, a paper was published um, from a leading surgeon, fetal surgeon at the Children's Hospital um, in Philadelphia, Dr. Alan Flake and a team of researchers basically successfully enabled partial ectogenesis. So 
little bit of confusing terminology here, but we're going we're gonna to work through it together. And what they invented was what they like to refer to as the bio bag, which is basically an artificial womb, but only works partway through the gestation process. So as part of this article, what they shared was that eight preterm lambs were extracted from a pregnant sheet at between 105 and 120 days in terms of gestational age. So the the gestational period of lambs is very different than humans. But at this point in time, once extracted, these lambs, they were placed in the bio bag and that represented basically the equivalent of a 22 to 24 week old premature human fetus. They conducted a number of tests on lung maturation, brain growth, sleep wake cycles, and a whole host of other tests. What did they find? Well, they found that those lambs showed that they were completely within the normal range in comparison to lambs that were gestated through traditional pregnancy. Now, some of you may be thinking, well, what about their mental health? We don't know for sure. But from a physiological perspective, they were comparable to lambs born through the traditional gestational process. As you can imagine, this was a huge scientific milestone and represents the most advanced extracorporeal support system that exists to date. This invention, however, is not really full ectogenesis from day zero, as you can understand from the constraints of the experiment and as some of you have already highlighted, the complexity of actually reproducing the womb. So this is more of a second generation incubator or something that facilitates what academics tend to refer to in the literature as partial ectogenesis. So full ectogenesis, partial ectogenesis, and then artificial booms is a theoretical technology that would make full ectogenesis possible. A few years later, in 2019, Dr. Franz van de Boss, which again, Gary referred to, um, who is a professor of cardiovascular biomechanics, and Dr. Gide Oy, who is the head of perinatal issues, and their respective teams were actually awarded 2.9 million euros as part of the Future and Emerging Technologies grant. This grant is a really, really big deal in Europe, and it's part of something called Horizon 2020, which was a European program, and I say this in quotes, aimed at securing Europe's global competitiveness. So important to think about why this funding was provided. Doctors Van de Vos and Oi, as you can see in the second article, eventually created a spin-off called Juno. So Juno Perinatal Health, you can read all about them. They've got videos and other publication materials on the internet. But they're essentially hoping that within the next five to 10 years, there will be something ready for human clinical trials in terms of this partial ectogenesis machine that can help premature babies. That is their target audience. Both this group and Dr. Alan Flake's group have said very explicitly they have no intention of aiming for complete ectogenesis. Their target is prematurity. Now our story transitions to the present day and my doctoral research, which more specifically really launched in 2020, right in the middle of a global pandemic. I just want you to imagine right now that there are thousands of people around the world who had suddenly lost their last hope of having a biologically related child. Why? Well, as you can imagine, with the rolling lockdowns, there were a lot of non-essential services that were shut down, including fertility clinics. So there are many people who are midway through cycles, who were on their last set of embryos, who no longer were able to conceive biologically. Now, it's within that context and with all the turmoil and uncertainty of COVID-19 that later that year in the fall, I launched my multinational qualitative study in both Canada and Australia. So it's qualitative, not quantitative, for those of you who are quants out there. Given the circumstances, it was conducted 100% virtually, which is not what I had imagined originally, but 
we had, as you can see, a pretty okay turnout nonetheless. So there were about 526 participants in Canada and Australia jointly that participated in a qualitative survey. And then a subset of those folks, approximately 12% or 61 people, participated in follow-up in-depth interviews, which ranged anywhere from sort of 45 to 90 minutes, depending on how much somebody had to share. Other than those interviews, I also conducted a number of interviews, 16, um, with key informants. And key informants are generally considered experts in their respective fields, and they somehow had a link to artificial wombs, whether that's being an expert in political theory or whether that is being an expert in bioethics. There were a whole range of expertise of folks that I spoke to, and they shared their perspectives as well. I'm still in the process of finalizing my analysis and thesis, so I'd love to come back and report on that when I'm allowed. But I'm not in a position to share the results of my study, but I'm hoping that we can use some of the common concerns and the potential benefits of artificial womb to then open up a, a broader discussion. I wanted to share a little bit more about my participants. There was a predominantly reproductive age folks who participated, predominantly cisgender women, predominantly white folks, very highly educated with over 70% having a bachelor's degree or higher. 55% had household income of 75K or more. So again, there's a lot of different privilege, I think, that will come out in terms of the results. But interesting for this group, perhaps, is that Almost 40% identified as agnostic, atheist, humanist, or none. The other big components were around a third who identified as some variant of Christian, Catholic, or Protestant, and then 6% Hindu. So you can see certainly how my networks, <laughs> predominantly this world, atheist, agnostic, humanist, or none, had perhaps some influence on where the survey went. Let's transition to common fears now. So I'm going to talk about health, social, legal, and ethical. So there are a few things. I won't, I won't read every slide because I am cognizant of time and I want to make sure that we have some chance for discussion. So some common fears. How will the fetal or lifespan uh, be impacted by artificial wombs in comparison to tra traditional pr pregnancy? Um, will there be an impact on maternal fetal bonding? Will attachment be impacted? Um, how will this impact lactation? What about lower quality embryos? Will they be allowed to survive in an artificial womb? Uh, from a social perspective, you know, will the existence of artificial wombs make people feel pressured to use them? So, you know, what will employers have to say about this? Um, is this a general commodification of another natural, quote unquote, process? Will it result in the denial of hard fought access to health insurance or public services or other benefits? Will it reduce the importance of concepts of womanhood or motherhood and further devalue people's reproductive capacity? There are issues around control and control over women's reproductive lives, family values impacting negatively obstetric expertise and also compensation, like will it have labor market impacts? And could there be discrimination between those that are born of people versus those that are born of technology? Turning our attention to the legal side of things, one of the biggest concerns is that somehow artificial booms could be used to limit access to abortion. And I really invite a discussion on this when we go to the Q&A. How will this impact, as I said, leave other parental benefits? Who will ultimately make a decision about pregnancy? It's no longer just the pregnant person, perhaps, that's implicated. Perhaps it's, it's people who have donated. Perhaps it's the intended parents. What would that look like? What happens in the case of an abandonment of an artificial womb? We have all sorts of life events that happen, death, divorce, separation, et cetera. What do you do? And what happens if we use a business-based model, if a business that is running artificial wombs 
runs out of money or has some other challenges? How would we handle that? Now, from an ethical perspective, you know, there are huge equity issues. So who will be able to access artificial wombs? Will it result in further reproductive stratification, which is basically a fancy way of saying only rich people get to reproduce and other people don't? It begs questions of what is the status, moral status of an embryo, fetus, questions around where does life begin, which have plagued us for time immemorial. And as I think Romy mentioned, will governments use artificial wombs to create armies or slave labor? Does this commodify childbearing? Is this an attempt to play with God or interfere with the miracle of birth? Are we just plain old interfering with nature? And what will be the impact on the environment of these types of technologies? On the other side of that coin, there are a long list of potential benefits, assuming that the technology is successful in being created. It could help in instances of physical infertility, social infertility, which is really like single people who want to bear children or folks into SLGBTQIA plus communities, or like Gary mentioned, his niece, who's like, terrified, which is a real thing. It's called tocophobia. It's listed under the general mental health bubble of how pregnancy can be disruptive to people's well-being. What about the positive impacts on maternal mortality and post-traumatic stress disorder, which is extremely understudied with regards to pregnancy and the birthing process, postpartum depression, prematurity, which we've talked about a little bit, and a whole bunch of sort of fetal and maternal environment issues like drug use, cancer, sterilization, fetal surgeries that could save the life of the fetus. And what role does this technology have to play in gender affirmation, as well as in instances of disability where people still have a desire to be parents? I didn't put it on here, but there's also um, a condition called MRKH which is really, really interesting because in about one in 5,000 women is born without a uterus entirely. So that brings up uh, a lot of questions around a potential benefit to those folks as well. In terms of social, individual autonomy, increasing family planning options, recognizing that bonding in some adoptive families is actually much better than in biological families. Um, combating gender norms, again, enhancing choice for people on the rainbow spectrum, enabling state subsidies, perhaps, of reproduction, uh, potentially an equal distribution of the economic costs of pregnancy or childbearing. So what would the impact be on pay equity, the labor market, intergenerational impacts of how wealth distribution might change as a result of these things? how representation might change. Would we see more women or female-bodied politicians, CEOs, et cetera? What impact might this have on careers broadly, models, athletes, people in law enforcement, et cetera, that really have a physical component to their roles? And does this combat narratives of pronatalism, which is this concept or this assumption that we often make or how funding and programming is, is that is pro natality, so pro-birth. And there are some studies that show that there is an increased risk of domestic violence associated with pregnancy. So how might artificial wombs inadvertently contribute to lowering that? Now, in terms of legal and ethical, there's potential for the removal of laws that punish women for poor pregnancy outcomes. And from an ethical perspective, this technology might divert those that are seeking surrogacy for a whole host of reasons, can provide for flexibility in the age of parenting, and for some, it can be a potential alternative to abortion when it's voluntary, unlike in the drawback section where it would be a coercive act where abortion would no longer be accessible. So, I think Judy set me up really well right at the beginning, but I wanted to link this back to our shared values and why I'm here with you today. I think given that we're all humanists or atheists or agnostics or some dimension 
of irreligious in this space, I think it's really important to recognize our shared values of rational inquiry, centering human dignity, advancing human rights and social justice, and ultimately being motivated by compassion. So as you've sort of learned a little bit about the sexual and reproductive health spectrum and had an opportunity to reflect on your own values, has anything shifted for you? Did some of the fears or potential benefits surprise you? Does rational inquiry make you want to explore the possibility of artificial wombs further or just shut it down completely now that you've heard me talk about it? What I would propose is that one approach you could consider is what is known as a reproductive justice lens. For some of you, you may be already aware of this, but reproductive justice is a really big shift that happened in the mid 1990s. So it's in 1994, a group of black women actually gathered right here in the United States and specifically in Chicago and coined this term. And reproductive justice actually moves the agenda forward from a rights-based agenda to looking at social justice. So it's reproductive rights and then social justice combined, reproductive justice. So RJ, which is what it's often referred to, is based on the UN Declaration of Human Rights, which is one of the documents that we often heavily rely on. RJ ultimately acknowledges and challenges power structures, and it understands that there is a lot of intersectionality with regards to oppression, and it tries to center the most marginalized. So ultimately, RJ says, it is a human right to maintain personal bodily autonomy, have children, not have children, and parent the children that we have in safe and sustainable communities which I think lines up really well with humanist values. My last question to you, I hope you've enjoyed this time that we've had together, is what would you choose in the Rawlsian justice framework where there's a veil of ignorance, you don't know where you're going to be born or with what positionality, would you choose society A, where part of the population, women or pregnant people, bear all of the risks and burdens of gestation or childbirth? Or would you choose society B, where ectogenesis or artificial wombs are available and routinely used? I will turn the floor over to all of you. And if you want to reach out to me, that's my email address, um, which I'll leave up for a few seconds before... I, uh, I close this out and then we can chat. Great. What wonderful questions to ask. Which uh, society would you rather live in? I guess you know, her talk pointed out the difficulty in making that decision. I mean, that there's so many more aspects to that ectogenesis than, <clears throat> that I thought about. I mean, just my, my nature is to worry about, oh, how about immunology? How about, you know, the, the complex uh, phenomena going on in there? Not thinking about, you know, how does it affect the labor market or you know, things like that? It's so much broader a question, million aspects. Yeah, like what are the unintended consequences of a new yeah. technology? Other thoughts? Marion. Sharisi, can you explain why would abortion be less available if there was? Yeah, so I want to clarify first and foremost that that's not necessarily my point of view. But there are some scholars that are very concerned and definitely comes up in interviews that I've conducted. So some people feel that if you have artificial womb technology, there will be certain parts of the political spectrum that will say, well, now there is an option where you don't have to parent. You don't also have to give birth but you don't actually have a right any longer to kill the entity that is inside your body. Because currently that's the only way that we have to deal with an unwanted pregnancy is to, is to terminate. So there are some people who would argue that if artificial wombs become available, then we will basically create laws across the board that prohibit all abortions and if you have an unwanted pregnancy, your choices will be, you know, give birth and parent, 
give birth and put up for adoption, engage in surrogacy, or a forced, basically what we could call a fetal transfer. So as soon as you find out, you make the decision that you no longer want to be pregnant. It's not a decision about whether this entity will exist or not. It's about now we're going to forcibly cut you open and transfer this fetus from your book from your body into an artificial womb, because now we have the technology that could allow for this life, potentially, if you want to argue that that's what it is, to continue without any imposition on your body. I think it's a very dystopian concern, uh, not to say, given recent events, that it's impossible, but I hope that makes sense in terms of what some of the fears are for some folks. Robert? Um, yeah, wow, I have so many thoughts. Um, one thought is I think a lot of women enjoy the whole process of being pregnant and giving birth. So, I mean, it would sort of be like saying we're going to get rid of penis and vagina sex because that's so yucky or something. Obviously, a lot of people <laughs> enjoy that. But I, I was uh, I was especially interested in the, the the point that was raised about uh, governments like using this to, for slave labor or armies or something like that, I do wonder, does there become a point where there are no parents? And then the question is, then who does have responsibility for deciding these ethical issues about how to raise the children and what can be done with them? The world is currently seriously overpopulated, in my view. So I don't see any reason why we should be doing something to make it more populated. But I do like Gary and Noreen's point, which is that if we are going to add people to the planet, it'd be nice to choose them to be in line with our values of what we want people to be. He talked about genetic engineering to achieve that. Obviously, it depends on people's values. I don't have any good answers to any of those things, uh, but those are certainly thoughts that come to mind. One of the things that I find personally a bit of a logical fallacy, I don't know if I can call it that, in terms of the concerns around the use by of the state to create soldiers or armies, is kind of like this reality that when you come out of the womb after nine months of gestation, you don't have the capacity to like really do anything that is useful to the state. And so, you know, we have to ask ourselves, why would the state take on that burden for like maybe 10 years, 20 years to get you to the point where then you could be part of some sort of army or part of slave labor? I think the other thing we want to think about is also how other pieces of technology are impacting things like militaries already. So, you know, how much are we using person to person combat versus other types of technologies to do things from a distance. And so maybe the needs of warfare as, as undesirable as that may be, may, may shift to be something different than what we're currently talking about. So just a few thoughts to put out there. I think Gary, you wanted to say something and then Meredith? Yeah, uh, I, I think this opens up, this along with in vitro fertilization and genetic engineering all together uh, result in possibilities that, that are way outside what has evolutionary become humans. So we have families or there, I think there, uh, that, that is through evolution. We love the kids, that's part of evolution. Men are more aggressive than women, women generally, I think it's fair to say, and and uh, women have different emotions than men, and a lot of that is due to evolution. If we no longer need to uh, have women carrying babies, th there's not re really much reason for more than one sex. And in terms of the engineering, it appears possible to to do that. I, so I, I prefer to think in terms of, of uh, from this point, design upgrades rather, rather than evolution. But but future upgrades may uh, make men a, a bit, uh, come up with ways of making men a bit less aggressive, for example, or make other changes to men and women. Sex organs may disappear. That has a lot of other implications, certainly biologically as well, because there are a lot of hormones related to all that. It's all going to be very complex. 
I, I, I think it's very intriguing, actually. And I think we may end up some, with something different than family we know, families we know now. Maybe it will become a more communal process, for example. Yeah. Uh, I'm just saying that as a possibility. It's not that what I prefer, but I think it might be an acceptable way in the future. Yeah, absolutely. And I think something to think about um, with regards to genetic engineering and evolution and how things maybe are changing already and we're not awake to it is a rising rate of just infertility that's rampant in the population. So this is increasing exponentially over the last few decades. And so we have to kind of wonder what's causing that. And I don't think, as far as I know, that we have a very good answer to that question. But some of those changes might already be happening. And so there are some organizations, demographic organizations, that are predicting a, a very sudden population cliff. So I think the, the year is 2050, and then there's expected to be a big decrease in the number of people on the planet. And there are folks like Elon Musk who the jury is out on him, um, but, you know, went on Twitter uh, many months ago now and said something to the effect of, we need more people because we need to populate other planets. So I didn't even raise that in the possible sort of ethical, legal, <laughs> social <laughs> concerns, but people have aspirations beyond planet Earth. And so perhaps in a colony, it makes more sense to take people. I don't want to use men and women. I, I don't want to use that language um, because I think the gender issues are important to acknowledge. So people who are not pregnant perhaps are better to go and populate a new planet and perhaps artificial wombs are the most effective way that we would reproduce on some other planet because otherwise the physical impacts of pregnancy and maternal mortality, et cetera, it's perhaps are difficult to account for. So just another wrench to throw into things. Go ahead, Gary. A question about the technology. I guess I really didn't understand. So the, the work in the Netherlands, what's come of that? They, they're only talking about partial. That's, uh, yeah. Diseases. So that's really as far as they got. Are there people looking more at, at the full ectogenesis of lower organisms, for, for example, at least? Uh, yeah. So folks are working on uh, mice, for example, and they're also working on creating artificial human embryos from stem cells. And so there is a huge evolution in terms of the embryonic research space in terms of the big body, which is the ISSCR, I believe, recently changing its policy. There's something internationally, which is called the 14-day rule. And in basically Western countries or the global north, there is a general consensus that we don't interfere with embryos in terms of research beyond 14 days. So this is one of the biggest limiting factors from a policy or legislation perspective in terms of why folks are not looking at the front end. But you can imagine if we have now successfully saved premature babies, maybe not in 90% of instances, maybe we're not at that success rate yet at 21 weeks, you can imagine that we could, in theory, get more and more efficient. And so you have this sort of like gestation gap. So we can do things from zero days to 14 days of an embryo. From 14 days to, say, 21 weeks, we have this gap because of this legislative barrier on the front end. But these technologies will continue to improve and perhaps it will just work its way backwards. So it'll start with 21 weeks and then it'll be 20 15. And at, at some point, I think scientists are already pushing for a change to the 14 day rule. So they're pushing for that to now go to 28 days as a minimum and actually to go for a case by case basis based on the research. And once that can of worms opens, there's certainly more possibility to understand why do like 50% of pregnancies end in a loss. There are a lot of times where people have miscarriages where they didn't even know that they were pregnant because of something, you know, as part of that process that we don't understand well, and a whole bunch of other embryonic implications and research. Does that answer your question, Gary? Yeah, very well. One other thing, that this might be outside your, your wheelhouse, but I've, I've read of where uh, people are starting to uh, take out multiple eggs and compare them genetically and then pick the best one that that's becoming a big thing. To me, that's very interesting. Yeah. 
Yeah, well, absolutely. There's, genetic tests. there's all sorts of genetic testing that's possible as part of the fertility process. Meredith, I'm thinking about the technological aspects of how this artificial womb would work. Would the source of the embryos be from what we now have in vitro fertilization type uh, methods, or would it be from virtually cloning, which has its own problems in terms of evolution and needing the input of two different sets of, of DNA. If it's what we usually think of now as in vitro, that is taking an egg from one donor and taking sperm from another, unless they improve the technology for that, it still is quite a burden on the female partner. The female person is the one who goes through much more of the... Well, the, I mean, it's, it's extremely <laughs> painful, right? Like, there are a lot of injections, a lot of hormones. Um, yep. It's very invasive. It is definitely not, if my parents are watching, it's definitely not masturbating into a cup. Sorry. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, and it messes up hormones almost as much as, you know, absolutely. going through pregnancy. The benefits of, are, are, I mean, I can see lots and lots of benefits. How is it envisioned that this would be actually done? I mean, how would you actually put the embryo into the womb, <laughs> as it yeah. were? With yeah, the absolutely. I think the, the field is completely open, and I think it's conversations like this one that will, I hope, contribute to decisions around how this technology develops and or doesn't develop and what mechanisms would we put in place. So something that could really change the way artificial wombs work is parthenogenesis. So this is this idea that you do not need two types of gametes like that one gamete can you know in and of itself be part of the reproductive process so maybe there would be advancements in that uh, there's also a, a lot of research that's being done in terms of just improving IVF effectiveness so maybe they will come to some breakthrough there maybe it is something more systematic, like subsidies for freezing eggs at a, a younger age where it's less. I think, I think it's completely open. I think there is many iterations, you know, one of the questions that, that always comes to mind is, is this going to be a new babies are us model, right? Like, is it something that is done by the private sector? Is it run by government? We, we clearly seem to have some underlying fears of government bodies doing this stuff. Is it international organizations? Do we work with partners to make sure that everyone is doing this in a way that respects human rights and human dignity? Please. Um, so yeah, I think yeah. there are a whole, whole, whole host of questions. Yeah, private companies doing it is not better than governments doing it necessarily either. Not necessarily. <laughs> No, no, absolutely. In this uh, country, everything is profit uh, motivated, and that has all kinds of implications. And, and I mean, we can see how that works in the commercial surrogacy landscape, right? Like, it certainly is benefiting some people. I'm not sure if it's that end person who's actually doing that reproductive labor or not. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I have a bias, I guess, about this is the fact that women are the only people that seem to have babies at the moment, and this is all being done by guys, and I don't trust them. <laughs> I do not trust the fact that they're going to look at this, and you're now talking about, okay, we're going to have this embryo and this fetus, and therefore you can't have an abortion because it's a, a, it's a living thing, and I still don't buy that because it's not living to me until it gets out, but obviously I'm way behind on technology. But I don't trust that they're not going to still sit there and decide to control women and what we do and what we cannot do. And I just do not buy it at that point, at this point. I just, I think it's terrifying. I just don't think they think far enough ahead. And I don't think there are enough women involved in this. And these are all guys talking and they don't know much about it. Technically yeah. right, but not the physical and so, you know, I, I think part of that is my, my um, 
for perhaps the way I presented the story. So I did try and acknowledge the the teams behind some of these folks that are, you know, the leads of their respective labs. There are certainly women who are contributing, for example, to Juno Perinatal Healthcare. It's run by, uh, my understanding, is two young women um, in in conjunction uh, with these sort of scientific experts and you know the Dr. Alan Flake's team has a number of women uh, the first author on that paper is actually a Canadian woman um, so there are certainly women that are involved and I think thinking about it if I may respectfully suggest Pat in terms of the binary of men and women doesn't actually capture sort of all of the the gender issues around it so there are a lot of you know, for example, trans folks that want to engage in, a, you know, the reproductive process or folks that identify as non-binary, so they wouldn't right. have uteruses, but, you know, they don't consider themselves women who right. want to be part of these conversations. And so I think the coercive power that you're talking about, yeah, totally scary for sure. Whether that is limited to sort of people with penises or whether that is driven by other motivating factors like money, profit, et cetera, like to be seen. Um, but I, I, I apologize if I sort of misrepresented who no, was no, working I, or, I, or thinking about it. No, I think it's probably my bias and I just don't trust them. Totally. And you're not no, alone in on. that. There's lots of, lots of people. That's why it was in the common fears. <laughs> yeah, Trishti, I have a couple of thoughts that occurred to me. One is I've got friends who are 30-somethings and 40-somethings, and uh, they're like, oh, yeah, we all freeze our eggs, you know. <laughs> and uh, I was like, oh, you know, you planning on having children? Oh, yeah, we freeze them. You know, we all freeze them. I'm like, really? I wasn't aware of that. I'm, I'm beyond that age. Yeah. I don't know if anyone's talked to them, though, because that process is not super effective. So oh. I hope that they're not 100% banking on that, because it to go from a frozen egg or a frozen embryo to then a live birth is I think still like don't quote me but like definitely under 50 percent like it's 20s and 30 percent chance I think so it's and I think they have to pay like a maintenance fee to keep those Absolutely. eggs frozen and stuff Absolutely. which goes to Pat's point you know yeah. <laughs> somebody's making money off of this and totally. my second thought is oh I can be very cavalier about it. oh yes you know have an abortion and that's no problem and all that and but yet I think about if I had like a mother cat here who had baby kittens prematurely and it looked like the kittens were going to die and the mother didn't care, I would be all over those kittens, feeding them with bottles and doing whatever I could to let the little kitties survive. Yeah. And I'm like, huh, it's interesting how, you know, I kind of take a more of an intellectual or dispassionate approach to, well, if I want to have an abortion, I can have an abortion. That's my right. And yet the little kitten, I'd do anything to save it. And then you show that they have fetuses that have uh, become viable at 21 weeks and save them. And, and then this technology is going to continue to make them viable younger and younger. I'm like, would I really Possibly. be like that versus the kitten? But then I would think, okay, so then let's say they have that viability. And then let's say if I'm childbearing age and I don't want to, I want to have an abortion. I'm not ready to be a mother. And the state says, no problem, we'll just transfer the embryo into this artificial womb and you don't have to go through with it. Then I'm like, well, wait a minute, my yeah, DNA yeah. is my intellectual property and I want the rights to my DNA. And I don't know if I'm comfortable having a descendant of Judy out there that I'm not connected to, aware of, or taking care of. So, I mean, I just see it's just a whole spaghetti mess of interrelated feelings and Absolutely. issues and technology. Not to mention the possibly coercive major surgery that would be required in order to actually extract that embryo or fetus, depending on what stage of the gestational process it's at and the risks associated with that. So in many ways, a terrifying possibility. Yeah. Oh, Marion, you have another thought you want to share? I just thought I'd add a little humor. I, I was a sex educator in the Bible Belt for 31 years, and there were very few Jewish people there. And sometimes people would say, well, what's the Jewish position on abortion? When does a fetus become a person? And the answer was when they graduate from medical school. 
<laughs> I love it. <laughs> I think CRISPR has escaped regulation. I think uh, this technology is liable to escape anything we say today. Uh, sorry, I, I just wanted to make sure I understood. You're saying CRISPR technology is liable to escape regulation? Yes. I mean, it already has. Yes, absolutely. With um, the attempt to remove, I believe, the genes that would transfer maternal to fetal transfer of HIV. Um, I, For my last reading of that case, it was unsuccessful. So Certainly, I'm glad that we're having these conversations. I hope that it doesn't scare us from continuing to make investments in sexual and reproductive health, which are, from my perspective, much needed, and in terms of trying to understand biological processes. But yeah, hopefully we can find a way to, to have these conversations and contribute to the dialogue around what the best setup is in terms of laws and regulations. Thanks, yeah, Bill. Shristi, thank you so much for bringing all of this to us. It's a uh, cause for a, a lot of uh, <laughs> deep thought and uh, mind-blowing possibilities and concerns. So thank you for taking the time to prepare and to come and share this with us. Thank you all for attending. And uh, again, thanks to our speaker, Shristi Haku, for um, speaking to us this month. Thank you so much. It's been an absolute delight. You're a wonderful group, and I hope I get to meet some of you the next time I'm in uh, Santa Barbara. <laughs>